So Duncan's comment about starting a conversation is just about the perfect segue for what we're about to do now. You've been listening with rapt attention, as I have, to uh, some wonderful insights. Uh, now's your chance to ask questions, make a comment, be part of the conversation that we've been listening to this evening. There's a microphone uh, in the front here on both sides, but it's a small enough room that if you stand up and project, we can probably hear you. So I'd just like to invite anyone to make a comment or ask a question of our speakers. Evan's ancestors were particularly uh, healthy and good-looking. <laughs> <coughs> I'm, I'm told. <laughs> uh, I, I think that in the future, we will continue to have pressures on indigenous populations' health, you know, as they take more and more losses, you know, because, because now um, uh, indigenous people still have um, somewhat of their territories. They still have um, some of their... Um, animal and uh, plant stocks. Um, they still have largely um, clean water, but in 50 years and 100 years, um, you know, with more and more newcomers, and as the world starts to change, they will lose more and more of that. And so I do wonder if their health will continue to decline um, with the pressures of these waves of migration. If they'll continue to pay the price for the, you know, for those um, newcomers to continue to do well. Yes. Sure. Um, actually, it was, it was um, us who instituted the indigenous, indigenous Cultural Competency course because there were so many um, First Nations people who were saying they were um, still, unfortunately, from time to time, not all the time, but from time to time having racist or colonial experiences that were degrading to them uh, when really all they were asking for was some help with their, with their health. Uh, and, uh, and so it was actually fairly easy for us to say, as a group, collectively, the federal and provincial partners with us to say, um, we will make it a requirement that all 100,000 of us, of our workers, will take this short course. And uh, we did hear some uh, negative comments, people saying, you know, how can you force us to take a course? Who has nine hours to spare? Who's going to pay those nine hours for that, uh, for that course? This is really quite hard. I already have cultural competency, but we just said, well, it's a requirement. It's actually really very straightforward for you to accomplish, and it's the least you can do because it's a good business model. Um, workers are trained to deal with the multicultural, pluralistic uh, <coughs> fabric of Canada, um, not just to serve the master race. I'm being very provocative here. Uh, you know, they need to serve everyone, and uh, they really got it um, very, very quickly. Most of the workers said, of course we want to be better at our jobs, and they just kind of got to it, and uh, for many of them, they just completed it in a day, and, uh, and they kept working, and I really wanted to say that to the workers that uh, for the most of you, um, diversity is actually instinctive. You just know that people are different. If you're, if you're a man versus a woman, if you're white versus black, if you're American born versus Canadian born, uh, et cetera, et cetera, that there, there are different approaches that might work better. Um, I, I think the, a couple of things. One is that um, it's not a one-off. Yeah, cultural competency training. You don't, you don't do the nine-hour course and then that's it. You know everything about Indians and, and everything's going to be great uh, when, when they come into your, your medical room. I, th I think it's something that needs to be renewed and refreshed all the time. I also think that different cities serve different populations. And so in Vancouver, uh, they should be doing a cultural competency course about Asians. <laughs> right? That, that makes sense to me. Um, and so it's, it's not just, uh, I mean, we're not talking just Indigenous-centric uh, vision of, of what kind of change needs to happen. But just, I mean, 
it astonished, I mean, when I talked about the TRC and the process, it, it, it astonished me to see what it's like to be in a setting where there's all this very important business going on, but that, that indigenous worldview was incorporated into the daily business. And it's as simple as the fact that when, when um, uh, our elder Diane, uh, you know, had a smudge here, the fire alarm didn't go off. Right? And, and so it's, it's, it's understanding and appreciating that and, and allowing for those kinds of things to happen in a hospital setting. And, and so I know at St. Paul's, St. Paul's, which is, a, which is one of the key uh, hospitals in downtown Vancouver, they now have a, an elders room where, where ceremonies can go on. And, and I've, I've had people, I've had people who, uh, who I've attended ceremonies with who said it makes a, a really huge difference when you don't have to kind of do something sneakily on, in, in, in a hospital corner and open up the window and everyone's blowing you know, the smoke out the window. <laughs> like when you've got a special room where you can set aside, so, so that, that kind of thing makes a big difference. And, and it's, you know, I, I don't know if that, I, I have heard that, that things have changed since Brian Sinclair in Winnipeg, but, but those are the kinds of things that jump, jump to my mind. Yes, here. Still on Agreed. Thank you. Yes. Um, I'd like to ask how violence against first nation women fits into your healthcare picture. Violence against women and how it fits into healthcare. So, actually, Evan and I talked about a little bit about what we were going to talk about. Uh, I talked about substance abuse being something that we in the Aboriginal community need to talk more about. I think sexual abuse is, is something that is even less spoken about. <laughs> um, and in fact, we've been doing not a bad job, and, and, and I'd actually like to hear Evan talk about some of the best practices for substance abuse. We've, we've been tackling that issue for the better part of three or four decades now in an Aboriginal context. Um, we're not doing as well. At, uh, devising strategies, especially in First Nation communities, not so much in an urban context is my understanding, but in First Nation, isolated First Nation communities on how to tackle sexual abuse, and in particular sexual abuse against young women. And so I think the stat is that, that about one in four, is that correct, 28% from the McCleary uh, study, uh, uh, young women experience sexual abuse. Um, and of course, that impacts their health. Um, and we need to, to come up with better ways of, of, A, allowing them to speak out, 
allowing them to, and, and B, offering them some kind of, of uh, assistance in health care. It's not easy to come forward right now if you're a young, young girl in the First Nation community. It's really, really difficult. We need to break the silence. Um, I worked in the downtown east side of Vancouver for five years, and I worked um, with women in the sex trade. Uh, and uh, it was very easy for me to see my sisters in those women, uh, to be extremely sympathetic to them and their um, battles with uh, substance use, with um, um, mental illness, that their, many of them, their children had been torn from them, and they just wished to be reu reunited, that they'd been exploited. What I didn't understand was the number of people who couldn't accept that there were men who lived off their backs, that there were hundreds of men who were invested in exploiting those women. So if a woman wanted a better life than being separated from her children, than having to sell her body for um, a very tiny amount of money, being subjected to rape and humiliation and being robbed and beaten, uh, and believe me, every single one of them um, very actively wanted out, uh, there were a whole contingent of men who were invested in keeping them exactly where they were. Uh, that was shocking. And just like in the Truth and Reconciliation Commissions, it, it wasn't a shock to me that children were raped and hurt and beaten, and some of them even died. Uh, it was that others couldn't believe that men of the cloth or women of the cloth, women of faith who were meant to be good people, could do that. Um, I think there are still many of us who don't do that. Even my own husband says, I don't believe all of these allegations of pedophilia and you know, that men do that to women, and surely that's, that's not possible. Human beings can't do that. And to those of us who work with those who suffer, and there are a number of physicians here whose job is to help people when they get hurt, and people predictably get hurt every single day. Um, we know that um, there are people who do terrible things. So, uh, yeah, how do we protect against them? Uh, well, one of the first things we do is, that, um, is to acknowledge that our young people need protection. So um, when this young woman, Sinclair, was raped um, and someone tried to kill her through her in the river uh, in Winnipeg, I remember fighting with a woman, like verbally sparring with her. She said, what was wrong with her? Why didn't she know to not stay out that late in Winnipeg and to go with two men that she didn't know? And uh, I was furious with her for, for days that, um, that she would blame a vulnerable young woman for um, you know, her rape and torture and attempted murder. It was just utterly shocking to me. So that's one of the things that we do. It's, it's kind of a natural reaction. I saw it when I worked in Children's Emerge. A parent screaming at their child, bleeding, suffering, even dying, and saying, what the hell is wrong with you? Why did you do that? And if you're that person screaming at others, saying, what the hell is wrong with you? Um, you should really rethink um, what you're doing and um, maybe kind of evolve your knowledge about how to, how to be helpful. Oh, yes. Sorry. Yes. Um, do we have stories where we talk about traditional, traditional medicines yeah. being helpful to people? No, no, we don't. It, so I, I think it's an excellent idea. As as a as a journalist, I mean, I think I think stories can, can really help share can, can share all kinds of of uh, teachings. Yes. Yeah. It, I mean, one of the challenges that that I face as a journalist in, in when I when I tell stories about spiritual healing um, is that those ceremonies were were outlawed for so long uh, that people are very reticent to talk about them. 
Uh, they don't like to share with outsiders because they're not sure how they're going to use that information. You know, they're, 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 we've, the outsiders have been coming to the to indigenous communities and, and taking, taking, taking for so long now that it, people are very hesitant about, about talking about ceremony or, or taking pictures of ceremony or, or that kind of thing. And so that's one of the challenges. Is, uh, but, but I have I met an increasing number of healers who understand that, that the kids are, are on the iPhone. I mean, that's, that's where they're getting their information. And so, yes, it's helpful to go on a three-hour drive in the, in, the, in the Elders F-150, but, but all, maybe a three-minute video might, might also be another way of teaching young people about these things. So I, th I think we'll, we'll, we'll start, to start to head in that direction of, of, of more teachings being shared, uh, whether it's textbooks or videos or, or that kind of thing. And, and I think that would really help people understand what Indian medicine is. I'd be curious to know what, what Diane has to think about it, has to say about it, and, and maybe she'll share that with us. But um, you know, it, it it can be a real challenge for, for traditional people because, as I said, traditional healing is a process, and it's not something that you're supposed to get in a two-minute YouTube video. <laughs> oh, this is how I do it. <laughs> yeah, and remember I showed the slide about HIV-related mortality. That even if you have a magic pill, if someone doesn't trust you, they won't take it. And uh, ditto in this case. I mean, it was a very antagonistic relationship between the oncology team and, and this mother. It was really um, unfortunate. No, no, I was lucky enough to hear from the mom last week. And, uh, and she said, of course, she would consider chemotherapy if her traditional treatment and the nutritional treatment she was receiving at a clinic in um, uh, the United States failed. Uh, and uh, we were smug in BC. We said, mm, you know, our traditional healers work alongside our Western physicians. I literally, I work with a naturopathic physician who's a traditional healer. My godmother is a, a naturopathic um, physician and traditional healer. Uh, and uh, we listen to each other. We agree not to oppose each other. And so if, if we had a nurse who was being sarcastic and undermining our patient and bumping them out of care, um, heads would roll. Uh, uh, and uh, I, ideally, you would be backing each other up. In fact, 80% of patients use complementary therapies. Um, they go back to basics, eat properly, get some sleep, reduce their stress, they take vitamins, they do yoga, they exercise, they pull out all the stops. So actually, um, uh, some of the ideas that this mother was talking about were not, are, are not crazy and, and weird. Um, they really ideally should have been working together. Thank you. Yes, here.
No, it's, it's a great question. Uh, are these microphones on the sides, are they amplifying mics so the audience... No, they're not amplifying mics? Because I know probably in the back you couldn't quite hear the question. I'll kind of paraphrase. Um, the, the, the question was, um, uh, what about um, education on reserve and what are the um, differences living on and off reserve? So, and how to bridge the gap. So I'll try and start. In, in, in BC, we looked at um, uh, we looked at teen pregnancies and um, First Nations girls. Uh, we actually, because the province of BC did a report on exactly that subject without consulting with First Nations, and it caused an enormous uproar. And it talks to the, like the idea of data. The province collects the data, but it was about us. And then they made a com they made lots of comments about. Um, the appropriateness of teen pregnancy in First Nations communities. When we looked at it, um, we saw that the outcomes for teen moms, the physical outcomes for teen moms, were very similar to the outcomes for other residents in BC. That being a teenager was not a physical risk um, for um, young moms. And that made sense to us. We thought, oh yeah, okay. You know, young women can have babies um, without physical risk. Uh, and actually, we saw in British Columbia for the first time that infant mortality was going up because older moms, uh, largely for non-First Nations women, were having babies later in life and their infant mortality was going up because of um, artificial uh, reproductive technologies. Uh, and so we saw this idea that um, being teen and being pregnant was really just a social risk, not a, not a physical risk. And uh, it pointed out yet again that if you're not investing in um, teens with, uh, who are pregnant, you know, if they're subjected to extreme poverty, and we had lots of data showing that um, young women who were pregnant had phenomenal social risk. They had a severe curtailing to their opportunities for work, for education, for um, income. Uh, they just didn't do very well, and we weren't doing enough. We weren't spending enough to protect them when they were pregnant. So uh, it doesn't surprise me to hear that there are still terrible stories of teen moms on reserve um, you know, who, who aren't getting, who aren't getting ahead at all. But that's a social issue. It's not a, it's not about physical risk. So, um, one of the things that we do in BC is we in, we invest a lot in infant um, maternal programs, maternal infant programs. It's a, it's actually very low cost and uh, very well proven to help a great deal. If we have time for one more question, yes. I want to re read a, a quote from Dr. Hastings, uh, whose you know, name is on this lecture. No health department can, face, uh, can force the citizens to use this pure water or drink this safe milk, nor can they force them to subsist on a properly balanced diet, although every item of it be inspected before its sale. Only the individual can do this, and the part of the Department of Health is to teach him what to drink, what to eat, how to arrange his life to secure the maximum of efficiency together with the maximum of health. Uh, and uh, my boss, uh, Perry Kendall, the chief medical officer for BC, wanted to add that nowadays we recognize the power of commercial enterprise to corrupt that endeavor and call on governments to work to make conditions that make the healthier choice the easier choice. So it really is the individual who's the center of the storm, not the health professional. And so we, we try and prime the conditions so a young woman has every opportunity to make a good choice. For us in Indian country, it's very simple, simple, simple to say, we need to ask young women, are you drinking while you're pregnant? But really how you ask it uh, begets the answer and the outcome. So that's not knowledge-based, that may be something else. Maybe it's more skills-based than knowledge-based, right? 
Dr. Smiley's not in me over there. She's a, one of the gurus in infant maternal health for Aboriginal populations. So I think I would ask that um, health workers just be a little more sophisticated um, in their approaches than, than just being knowledge-based. Okay. okay. Well, Evan and Duncan, on behalf of all of us, uh, I'd really like to thank you for sharing uh, not only your personal experiences, stories I think have been extremely important, and your expertise, and, and in those ways you've really outlined for us uh, what I think are some difficult truths that all of us, in fact every Canadian, probably needs to see. Uh, and I think you've brought us a step closer to understanding what part we can play in supporting the process of reconciliation and healing. And one of the takeaways for me, I think, is that both of you, from your own context, have spoken about the role that both traditional health services and um, uh, Indigenous health services can both play a role in trying to address some of the health inequities facing Aboriginal peoples in Canada. And I think that's a, that's a good takeaway message because the issues are very significant and I think it's going to take all of our resources and our best efforts to, to tackle them. So thank you very much on behalf of everybody. Thanks.